I'm Betty Lau, uh, Janice's uh, lifelong buddy and a uh, fr uh, friend to the Chow family through the daughter, Cheryl Chow. Uh, we are so, Brian and I are so honored to be here to speak about the accomplishments of this remarkable person. It was really hard to try to distill her essence into uh, the, the time frame, but uh, here we are to give it a try. Uh, there are so many uh, firsts and recognitions that, uh, and I refer to her as Auntie Ruby, uh, from uh, recognition from Newsweek magazine, the Washington State History Book, Seattle Met, uh, North, Nordstrom's uh, Northwest Women of Note, the Washington State History Museum, hundreds of news articles. Uh, where do we begin? Uh, she had, her, among her first were the uh, first woman president of a Zhonghua Benevolent Association worldwide, the first Chinese cookbook, the first Chinese frozen food business, first Chinese restaurant out of Chinatown, first Chinese cooking show. It, it just goes on and on. Next. So, uh, as Brian and I were contemplating her service uh, to community, uh, we decided it, it basically fell into uh, three groupings that we want to address. The early years where her character was uh, formed, her humanitarianism that she brought to everything that she did, uh, the way she bridged uh, communities to effect cultural and social change and of course her work in creating the Chinatown that we know today. Next. She was born in 1920 on San Juan fishing dock. Brian can you put the cursor on the dock? Yes. Uh, and that was because her father Jim Singmar was dock foreman for the Chinese cannery workers and as such, uh, they were given a separate room to live in, whereas the dock workers were crowded into uh, bunk style housing. Uh, the other photos, uh, because she had two older brothers and many younger brothers, uh, Auntie Ruby was always in, uh, interested in uh, women's sports. And so Brian, can you, uh, yes, the this uh, undated, unsigned photo, I believe, could be the Seafair Court because uh, one of the women is wearing a tiara. Uh, there's a basketball. She herself played on a girls' softball team with someone you might know, Nancy, her dear friend, Nancy Helen Fisher. Uh, Brian, could you uh, point out the family members in the photo, please? Family members, huh? In the bottom oh. photo. Oh, this one right here? Yes, because some of them will appear in the following narrative. Okay. This is, uh, this is my mother, Ruby, and this is my father, Ping. Uh, this is uh, my uncle, Jimmy with my uh, mother's brother, older brother, and his wife, Louise. And uh, this is my uh, second oldest brother, Shelton, and uh, oldest brother, Edward. And, uh, all right, next. Next. Mm -hmm. So, little Ruby understood the value of work and when she was a young child, when she was old enough to walk and run, uh, she helped her mom sell lottery tickets. And you have to remember, this is right ahead of the depression. Chinese lottery tickets uh, don't use numbers. And they were in introduced at, uh, from a central location. Uh, I believe it was San Francisco and you could see the city names across there. and the Chinese characters are actually lines of poetry from uh, famous Chinese poets. And the way you would win the lottery is there would be a drawing. 
uh, of the poetry. And you could win by guessing which keywords in the poem would appear, and you would hit the bonus jackpot if you were able to guess an entire line of poetry. Uh, Brian, uh, the Chicago one that has the red marks on it, you could see uh, there's three characters with a black mark, and then down below it, uh, there's uh, four dark marks. That's an entire line of poetry. So this person's name is Tong Chang, and he won $100 uh, on, on this ticket. Uh, that was issued for uh, Chicago Chinese, uh, Ch Chicago's Chinatown. And so it was Auntie Ruby's job with her older brothers, George and Jimmy, to deliver these lottery tickets and to deliver news uh, of the person uh, winning or not. And her mother would mark the names of the winners and uh, use a calligraphy brush to mark the winning characters. Now, uh, the photo down below is the after they moved off San Juan Dock. Uh, her father was quite a bit older than her mother. I think, Brian, was it 30 or 40 some years uh, older? Anyway, he was the co-founder of Hop Sing Tong, and it is most likely they lived in this building that still exists on uh, one second building. In Washington. Yeah, second in Washington. Uh, I got it mixed up with where my family lived on fifth in Washington. Uh, and you can see the Chinese style balcony up above. And the building was sold about 10 years ago. And the Tong bought a, the China Gate building in Chinatown. They, they were the last holdouts in the second Chinatown. Okay, uh, uh, this one, uh, well, unfortunately, the depression hit in 1929 when she was just nine years old. During the depression there, uh, uh, her father uh, went back to China and unfortunately passed away, stranding uh, the, the Mars, uh, I think, there were, altogether, there were 10 of them. So uh, Aunt Ruby and George and Jimmy all decided the, they needed to drop out of school and uh, work to support the younger siblings and ensure that they had a chance at completing their educations and uh, the long shot chance of going to college. So to escape the poverty, uh, Auntie Ruby married quite young, had two sons, and uh, this marriage did not work out. Uh, it was abusive, and I kind of went into shock when, when she told me about it, and I said, well, what did you do when he hit you? And she said, what else could I do? I punched him. And that was a real surprise to me, because you have to remember, this is the uh, World War II era and uh, women were uh, supposed to be more submissive and uh, domestic than that. So she heard there was a job in New York, so she joined her best friend there and she went to, got a job, her, her best friend helped her get a job in the Howdy Club, which was a gay night, uh, nightclub in New York City. And she told me that that's where she really learned how to be a good hostess. Uh, she found out the more gracious, the more charming, uh, the more she talked about trying to raise two boys uh, as a single mother, the bigger her tips. And so that was the big lesson that uh, she learned from the Howdy Club. Well, and that is uh, uh, for entertainment, uh, she met Ping Chow, who was an opera star in a traveling Cantonese opera company. And there were lots of women chasing him because he was such a, a, a magnetic, charming star. And 
the opera troupe was getting ready to leave and he became very ill, landed in the hospital, and all the girlfriends left him, except Auntie Ruby. She, after work or before work, she would uh, get the kids settled in and then she would take a long bus ride across town to go to the hospital to visit him every day. Well, he could only speak Cantonese. Uh, she knew some Cantonese, uh, but she taught herself how to write Chinese, how to speak it better so she could communicate with him. So eventually they married and moved back to Seattle where they both worked at the Hong Kong restaurant. And down below you could see uh, the first restaurant, a former boarding house. And they picked the boarding house because they needed to have their growing family nearby uh, and keep an eye on, on the kids. And the truck that you see there is uh, the delivery truck for the Chinese frozen food business because uh, a lot of customers would say, oh my gosh, I can't eat there. I, I'm on the night shift or I, I, my work hours don't allow it. And uh, can it be frozen? And so she experimented and yes, and that's how the frozen first Chinese frozen food business uh, grew. Uh, with the restaurant, they were taking a huge gamble because uh, all the other Chinese restaurant owners said, you're going to fail. Nobody has a restaurant outside of Chinatown and you're going to have to come crawling back here. Don't do it. And of course, as soon as you say don't do it or it can't be done, she and Uncle Ping proved them wrong. Next slide. Uh, not only did the restaurant become a popular success, it was also uh, a very upscale restaurant. Uh, most of the Chinese restaurants and the criticisms were uh, valid. Uh, people go there for the food. They don't go there for the decor. They don't go there for uh, sanitary conditions. They go there for the, the food. So uh, in getting the restaurant uh, established, uh, you remember Brian showing his Uncle Jimmy and uh, Auntie Louise. Uh, their daughter was playing with Cheryl. Uh, I think this is behind the restaurant, Brian. Yeah. Uh, they were playing out behind there and it was right after the war and a woman passing by said to Trisha, her niece, little girl, don't play with the enemy. And Auntie Ruby happened to, uh, had come out because she saw the woman stop and try to talk to the children. And when she heard that, it, it really impacted her. What, what can I do to create more understanding that all Asians are not alike, we are not the enemy. So she came up with a plan and she went to the Zhonghua Benevolent Association and said, we need to have a PR campaign to create understanding of uh, Asian cultures, especially Chinese, uh, uh, many of whom were being harassed uh, and, and uh, because they uh, mistaken for uh, Japanese. And so, they said, okay, Ruby, if you want to do that, go ahead, but you know, don't bother us about it. And so she did. She threw herself into charity work with the March of Dimes, the Seattle PI Ice Cabades, uh, with uh, uh, Matrix Table fundraisers, and she decided to participate in Seafair. And that's why you see the floats here. Uh, Brian, can, can you this explain that the, upper right slide? Uh, this is the, uh, the very first restaurant uh, when they started. And it says up here, Ruby, Ch Ruby Chow's Chinese Dinners. And uh, here's my mother. And here's my father. And here are all the, the guests that were uh, in the restaurant and asked to come outside to watch the, these uh, performers. And uh, these, this is uh, a traveling... Uh, performing 
group from uh, Hong Kong that were uh, good friends with my dad during that time. And here's my dad down at the bottom holding up this acrobatic. And there's my mother in her, uh, she always had really pretty vest or coats. And, and down here at the, uh, this particular float, this person right here is, uh, sub, is uh, representing a, I guess it's a, a Chinese queen, but, uh, but is, this particular person is actually a Chinese sailor from Taiwan. Uh, it just so happened that uh, the uh, Taiwan would come, Taiwan Army would come over, uh, and uh, the U.S. would give them PT boats and train them, and uh, different other types of uh, ships. And they, these, uh, the crew would be uh, stuck in Seattle for probably maybe a month. And so my mother would go down there to every time they brought in a new crew from the Republic of China. Uh, they, uh, she, she would uh, introduce them to the Chinese community and just make them feel more like at home. So this guy, this here is actually a, a guy. And it was quite uh, common in Chinese theater for men to play women's roles and vice versa uh, in the opera. It, it was considered a, a very, very uh, highly skilled uh, acting. Uh, that demanded that the person really understand the other gender. Uh, and on rare occasions when it was called for, Brian's father also played female roles in the opera. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is the, uh, one of the iterations of the inside. This is uh, what we mean by upscale Chinese restaurant. Uh, the uh, Auntie Ruby and Uncle Ping went to Hong Kong and personally picked all the pieces uh, for the restaurant. And those pieces today are in the Wing Luke uh, uh, Asian Museum. So, and for any of you uh, that did uh, frequent my parents' restaurant, I, I believe you uh, would recognize uh, some of these rooms, but uh, this is the uh, menu, and and this is a, a, a small recipe book that she would give to the uh, patrons that came and uh, ate at her at the restaurant, and then give them this uh, recipe book, and they go home and try cooking that. And if you look well, if you can see it, uh, can you back up one? Yeah, right there. Uh, it says cookbook, and that's uh, what uh, one of her first. Now, the if you could open the menu, you would see a five-course dinner in the late 40s or early 50s cost the grand sum. Remember, this is an upscale restaurant. It cost $1.00 and 25 cents per person for a five course meal. If you wanted, she had a, they had a liquor license and if you wanted a shot of whiskey with your meal, that would cost you the, the princely sum of 50 cents a shot for whiskey. Uh, now, uh, one more thing about the restaurant is that uh, when they did the remodel, uh, they left one of the supporting walls up so that there was a back room. Brian, do you have a shot of that back room? Yes. And uh, the restaurant quickly became a gathering place for, for Seattle and the uh, county uh, politicals and social elite together because they would cut their deals in that back room. Uh, whereas the public uh, front room was more open. And uh, one time Aunt Ruby said, uh, a well-known politician came in the front door uh, with his girlfriend. So she seated them. And then she got a phone call. Ruby, uh, I wanna make a reservation. This is so-and-so and it was the man's wife. 
So she said, oh yes, of course, come on in. So she invited the politician and his girlfriend to finish their meal and drinks in the back room while she occupied the wife in the front room. And then the husband uh, made a quick getaway out the back door. And in 1952, uh, because the Seafarer Committee met at their restaurant quite often, uh, one of them said, hey, Ruby, how's about you bring one of those uh, big dragons and run it in the Seafarer Parade? And so there it is in the bottom photo. She and Uncle Ping went to Hong Kong. Well, about the same time, uh, a group of Chinese girls came to her and said, we want to have a drill team like St. Mary's in San Francisco. And Aunt Ruby said, sure, why not? And, uh, but what are you girls going to wear? And so Uncle Ping said, how about the women warrior costume, uh, outfits worn at the emperor's court? And so that's why uh, you could see that. Uh, Brian, can you show the pheasant feathers in the top? Yeah, that is the rank of, that shows only generals can have those pheasant feathers. And uh, can you see me in there? We were arranged by height, so I'm kind of in the second to the last row, the girl on the end. Yeah, that's me. You and I look the same. <laughs> anyway, uh, starting the drill team was really important. And already, Auntie Ruby's uh, social uh, humanitarianism was showing because when when she started the drill team in 1952, it was called it, it is still called the Chinese Girls Drill Team. Well, one of her friends uh, was Dr. Giles Graves, an African American chiropractor who married Daisy Yao, and they had a daughter, Rosalind Graves, and. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, sh the small amount I know about Rosalind's life is from a, a book about one of her relatives who was a famous gallery owner in Seattle at the time, the first modern art gallery. Anyway, she uh, writes that Rosalind's family was ostracized for their mixed race marriage. And uh, they were rejected by both African Americans and Asians. So these Chinese girls said, um, yeah, membership will be open to everybody except Rosalind because she's only half Chinese. She's half black. And, and the term back then was colored or Negro, as uh, some of you will remember. And Auntie Ruby looked at them and said, you know what? This girl wants to be in drill team. She wants to learn about the Chinese side of her heritage. And you girls will accept her, you will respect her, or there will be no team. And so Rosalind Graves uh, became a team member uh, throughout her high school years. And since then, uh, the Chinese girls drill team has had uh, many members uh, of multi-racial backgrounds, uh, thanks to Auntie Ruby's philosophy. Next. All right, uh, this next section, because the restaurant uh, was became so famous, uh, and because Auntie Ruby was so uh, generous, she, I just saw them as stray kids staying at Brian and Cheryl's house. Uh, she took in the children of uh, Uncle Ping's uh, opera friends and the, they had remained connected after World War II because Cantonese opera was banned on the mainland. So the great opera troops fled to Hong Kong. They refused to give up opera and uh, Aunt Ruby and Uncle Ping went there, and because they, uh, the opera people could not speak English, they arranged for them to have care packages, uh, welfare benefits, helped several of them emigrate to the United States. 
and they allowed their children to stay at their home for years on end uh, without accepting a dime of that hospitality. So Brian, could you please explain about probably their most famous house uh, foster kid, Bruce Lee? Well, this is Bruce here. It's my father and my mother. And uh, I was about nine or 10 years old when he uh, came to the States. And uh, so uh, I didn't know what exactly he was, but uh, I did watch him practice. And then, uh, we had an area in the back of the restaurant. And he had a bucket, uh, a, waste, a waste bucket uh, full of gravel. And it wasn't the round gravel, it was the uh, sharp edge gravel. And if you can imagine just kind of butting up to that, uh, that garbage can, uh, facing the garbage can, and then uh, putting your fist uh, in front of your body and uh, basically having your two fists across from each other right at about waist high. And uh, he would just kind of pound his knuckles into that gravel, which uh, created those triple, triple, triple level calluses on his knuckles. And so, uh, and he did that to make his hands a more durable weapon. Uh, and, and he would just kind of, I, I don't know if you, any of you have seen those, those uh, wooden dummies. Uh, you've probably seen them now in these uh, different local uh, shows with the uh, martial artists kind of practicing. Uh, what is his name? Uh, Itman was his teacher, and they, they show a lot of that dummy. But he had one of those set up in the backyard, and he would just pound on that thing so hard. And, and that dummy was made out of a very hard wood. So at the same time with his making his fist so callous, he was also making his forearms and, and his uh, leg shin very, very tough. So... Uh, and that's just uh, a little bit of what uh, I remember of him. So uh, if I could tell you more stories of on and on, but the, I'll wait to the end if, if that's what you want to hear about. But uh, Bruce was one of the one of the famous people that my mother and father took care of. And they treated him just like a member of the family. All right, next, uh, because we're running out of time, we're going to show you some of the other celebrities. Uh, uh, okay, Bob Hope. Uh, Brian, can you explain the family photo down below? Uh, this is it again in the restaurant. And uh, this is my brother, Edward, my brother, Shelton, and then my mother and uh, my little brother, Mark, and then my sister Cheryl and myself and Giselle McKenzie. Uh, she she uh, was in, she's in this picture with uh, also Sammy Davis Jr. Next. Um, Faith Enyart was a very close friend uh, uh, of the Chow family. She is retired now, uh, but uh, because of her efforts to work with the Chows to uh, advance understanding of Chinese culture, uh, she received, uh, believe it or not, it was Man of the Year Award. Uh, there was no such thing back then as a Woman of the Year Award. Uh, and both these women were part of a group that uh, co-founded the Wing Luke Asian Museum and raised funds for it. And uh, Auntie Ruby paid for the fundraisers out of her own pocket and did not charge the museum. So a uh, caterer came to her one day and said, hey, you've had that franchise long enough. It's my turn. Uh, how much are your expenses and how much money did you make off the museum? And Auntie Ruby told her, Nothing. I donated all the food for all the fundraisers out of my own pocket. I made nothing. Every dime went to the museum. So that took care of the caterer. Next. Uh, 
one because she was uh, had to drop out of school herself. She really valued education and youth uh, voices and what they have to bring to the table. Uh, when I worked with her uh, after I became an adult, uh, I found she was exceedingly intelligent and very, very, very caring. And so uh, she is being honored here. Uh, she did so much for youth activities. In addition for the Chinese community, she promoted uh, King County sports when she was on the council. Uh, next. And so uh, because uh, the King County Council would come to the restaurant, uh, they started asking her, hey, Ruby, why don't you run for office? And she'd go, what, me, are you joking? And uh, finally they persuaded her. And the reason why she accepted was because she saw government as a way to help more people than what she was, and Uncle Ping were already doing on a one-to-one -one basis. She thought, I could do more good uh, if I can get into a, a political position. And that was her entire motivation. Next. Uh, here she is at the swearing-in ceremony, uh, an early photo of her council colleagues. She served for 12 years and has the distinction of being the first and the only Asian American ever to win a seat on the county council. Next. Uh, but the problem was the Republicans asked her to run as a Republican. Uh, the Democrats on the council asked her to run as a Democrat as she didn't know the difference. So uh, I said, well, well, how did you decide? I see on your campaign sign, you're, you're, you say you're running as a Democrat. She said, well, I didn't know what the difference was. Uh, I'm pretty conservative myself. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll run as a Republican. But then uh, I decided to study the platform. And I really liked uh, uh, the uh, fiscal aspects. And then I studied the Democrats platform and I, I couldn't decide. But finally I made the decision to go with the Democrats only because they seemed uh, to want to use government to help people. And that's what I'm all about. And that's how she decided uh, to do that. Now on this slide, uh, Harmony with an edge on it, uh, this article explains how she blended her, the Chinese uh, philosophy of harmony, don't get into conflicts uh, with her council work. Uh, and this begins uh, what I would like to say her uh, greater humanitarian phase. Uh, on the council, her staff told me uh, she was different from the other politicians in that she actually believed government is there to help people and not just people, but the individual. So the word quickly got around and so individuals will come to her, would come to her with all kinds of issues and she would help them one by one. Uh, she, uh, here she is with uh, constituents. She uh, listened and uh, because of her depression year uh, of experience and listening to constituents, she knew what needed to be done and she figured out ways to do it without getting into conflicts. She brought in the first bus shelters uh, by saying, well, we're, how come those poor people are standing in the rain? Where's the bus shelter? Oh, they're all up in the North End. Well, why aren't there any in the South End? See to it, get it done. And so she arranged with her colleagues to uh, seed the entire South King County with bus shelters. Uh, people complained about the airport noise. Oh, well, they know they're living next to an airport, so what? Who cares? And she never confronted her colleagues. She just said, well, how do we know they're not right? How do we know it's not noisy? And she commissioned the first airport noise studies, and uh, that got the airport port commission going on noise mitigation. 
she uh, was very interested in tax policies. She uh, held back, uh, you know, her phrase, uh, tax yacht owners, not seniors on fixed incomes. Uh, she provided immigration assistance, uh, immigrant youth. She went to Seattle schools to start an ESL program to help the immigrants integrate into society. Uh, and when she, and she found out, oh, there's, what do you mean you're going to uh, build a second tennis center up in the North End? Uh, isn't it the time to build one in the South End of Seattle? as she spoke to her city council colleagues. And they told her, well, Ruby, we're going to do it because tennis is really popular. That uh, tennis center is overcrowded and minorities don't play tennis. And she goes, what? What about Arthur Ashe? What about our own local Yi family? Champ state champions in tennis, members of the Seattle Tennis Club. And so by talking, and I think it was, it was Jeanette Williams, she persuaded the city council to build uh, a South End Tennis Center, today the Amy Yee Tennis Center. Uh, she had a face-off with superintendents and school boards about cutting the budget to ESL education because the parents had never complained. Uh, she had arranged with Representative Summers to for the state to provide extra support, temporary support, while the kids were learning English. And the school board, of course, wanted to fund other things with that extra money, and she stopped them time and time again. And I remember one time she and I went to go see Superintendent Olchevsky, who closed the building because it was unfit for education. However, he was going to move the immigrants into it so they could learn ESL there. So we went to see him. He came out and said, well, I'm sorry, Ruby, you're going to have to wait. I have a crisis uh, uh, with the teachers union and you understand how crises go. Yes, Joseph, and I'm your next one. Happy to wait for you. I, I went into shock. You, you didn't talk to Joseph Olchewski like that. Uh, now, uh, she became uh, quite good friends with uh, Senators Magnuson, Jackson, uh, yeah, Brian, yes. Uh, she was always invited to be part of the greeting delegation, uh, uh, even meeting uh, with President Jimmy Carter. Unfortunately, there are no photos of her meeting with John F. Kennedy or Richard Nixon. They came through Seattle in 61 campaigning. Uh, uh, for uh, uh, the presidential elections. And I bear witness to that because uh, part of the greeting was a marching band, I forgot what high school, and the Chinese girls drill team. So I was there. At least we were able to get their autographs. Uh, she believed uh, she started the annual governor's dinner that was held for 45 years until she passed. Uh, believing that uh, govern government needs to understand uh, all peoples. And so she always had these lavish 10, 12 courts Chinese banquets for government leaders so they could meet the Chinese community and understand more about Asian cultures. All right, Brian, next. Uh, working with Ron Sims. Uh, she was a great friend of Helen Summers. Uh, she worked with her on uh, bridging the, the gap and ensuring there was funding to help new immigrants, uh, thanks to Helen Summers. Uh, some of you might be familiar uh, and have benefited from the, the work of Dr. Lester Selvage, uh, a heart surgeon. He called her up one day and said, Ruby, I'm really desperate. I'm doing this heart research. And what I need is uh, dog heart tissue. And I went to the Humane Society and they told me, no, I went to the animal shelter. And back in the day, uh, animals were 
uh, euthanized uh, almost daily. And he said, I'm, I'm doing some important research. I need to compare human hearts to the dog tissue. I don't need a live dog. I told them I don't need a, I just, I just want the hearts from the dogs that have been euthanized. And I'll, if they can give me several, I won't need to ever come back again, but they won't let me do it. I, I re, it, please help me advance the cause of science. And she didn't know who he was, uh, but she said, yes, I will help you. Let me, give me a couple days. She called up the animal shelter. I'm uh, King County Council member, Ruby Chow. There is going to be a man coming to you after hours, a doctor. Give him whatever he wants from the euthanized dogs. And so uh, she made the arrangement. She called Dr. Selvage, and he was able to go there and uh, collect a, a lot of uh, dog hearts from which he uh, cut slices of tissue to compare with human hearts and, and conduct experiments so that he uh, in, could advance heart research and save human lives. All right, next. She was uh, a key person in starting Hinghe Park. Can you uh, show the arrow there, Brian? Uh, that's the Chinatown gate that she worked on near the end of her life. Hinghe Park uh, was the heart of the red light district. And because there were so many complaints in Chinatown, the city tore, bought the properties, uh, condemned them and tore everything down. Then they went back to her uh, and this letter is from Superintendent of Parks Townsend. Uh, Ruby, what do you want us to do with that empty space? And she said, well, you know, the people who are there need a park. How about a park? And they said, on one condition. What's your condition? We don't have any money to maintain uh, a garden uh, or to do any kind of maintenance. It has to be low maintenance. If you can promise us that, you can have a park there. So she arranged with her friend, the mayor of Taipei, who donated the structures that you see in the old part. Uh, there were marble stools, marble tables for people to play cards on, uh, benches. Uh, and then the uh, new addition down, is down below. Uh, that was recently completed a, a couple years ago. And so uh, roast duck diplomacy uh, with Senator Jackson. The INS building, uh, ooh, I only have two minutes. Okay, we're almost done. The INS building it was slated, rumors, uh, it was slated to be closed. Uh, for many years, and finally the feds got moving on it. They wanted to turn it into a work release program. Uh, and and uh, they said, well, this will be jobs for people in Chinatown. And she told them, not unless uh, all the prisoners can speak Chinese. And so she decided the only way to do this was carry a petition from all business and property owners and to take Senator Jackson, his favorite, favorite dish, Uncle Ping's famous roast duck, which uh, Auntie Ruby's staff called, promptly dubbed the roast duck diplomacy maneuver. She got on a plane with this roast duck, went to see Senator Jackson, and he put the kibosh on turning I the INS building into a work release program. Uh, uh, this is Uncle Ping. Uh, super famous star uh, in various roles and costumes, leading ladies would fight to have him as the leading man because unlike the other male stars, he made them look better. And he was willing to step back and let them have the scene, whereas others would not. Next, Brian. Uh, she defended uh, uh, people. Uh, the Wami massacre, it was too painful for us to use uh, an article from that because so many of them had children in my classroom. She knew every one of them. 
uh, the police, uh, she became the police liaison uh, on the Wami massacre. Uh, two years later, there was a Mahjong raid. Men, women, and children were thrown into jail. Uh, the mayor was her former lawyer, and she went, was called at 3 a.m. She went there and said, what the hell do you think you're doing? What would you do if they were all white people? And the mayor said, oh, we'd uh, release them on their own recognizance and ask them to come back next week. And so she got the women and children released first, and then the men were all released the next morning. Then down below, she saved Chinatown uh, with, uh, by compromising. There was a certain group of people who wanted to wipe out Chinatown and call it the International District because they needed a power base. But the power base was really, uh, be, by love and affection and service, Auntie Ruby's and Uncle Ping's. So the compromise uh, she agreed to was Chinatown International District, which encompasses Chinatown, Japantown, and Little Saigon, plus the Chinatown Historic District, which she brought into being. Next. Uh, the, uh, uh, she, was, she started the Asian political renaissance uh, uh, by uh, backing Wing Luke, the first uh, Chinese-American council member, Warren Chan, Lim Tui, John Ng, so that Rick, when it, Rick Anderson wrote about it, he said, uh, he wrote that uh, the number of Chinese in elected office is way out of proportion to their numbers, which was about 3,000 at the time. And he, both he and Gary Locke acknowledged her role in doing that. Uh, and when she was on the council, it, Asians started running for office because they looked at her and said, hey, if a person who's a high school dropout can get a seat on the King County Council, I can do the same thing with my degree from Harvard. And so for her many years of service, her constituents, uh, uh, found out there was a, going to be a new King County Park and uh, a naming contest. So uh, they went to the, the county parks department and said, we want it to be Ruby Chow Park. At first she declined the honor until a knucklehead said, no, I don't name it after her. And then she told her constituents, I would be pleased to accept this honor. And so there it is. Uh, because of her service, uh, the King County Council uh, built a new building and they named floor eight for her, the Ruby Chow floor, number eight, the Chinese lucky number. Brian, next. Uh, her legacy continues uh, through her family members. You know, uh, her son uh, served as uh, Assistant Secretary of Veterans Affairs under the Clinton administration. Shelton was a teacher, uh, Mark Chow was a judge, uh, Brian uh, became a business owner. Cheryl, of course, you know, uh, was state assistant superintendent of education, uh, principal, city council member herself, Seattle school board. Uh, and so her legacy continues through the grandkids. And finally, our health is a very private thing. But she had a stroke, and Swedish Hospital said, we really need you to be a role model to other people who refuse to come in or think it's not important when they have a stroke to come in right away. And she said, if it's going to help people, I'm all for it. And so that's her legacy and service. Uh, thank you very much. I know that he was just a busboy for two months, but why did it why did, was he given the job and why did he quit? One of the stipulations that my understanding of my mother or father would have him come to Seattle is that he would be treated just like, uh, like a, the other sons. And so all of all the sons and my sister uh, were required to work at the restaurant. I started uh, the cleaning the toilets and then doing the rugs and then doing the dishes and then becoming a uh, what they call a busboy who cleared the tables. So the, when Bruce showed up, uh, uh, he was not going to be just sitting around. He was required to do some work to, you know, keep his stay there. And uh, she put him in 
directly into a bus board. And uh, me, that was kind of cool because, you know, then it, I had to do all the other stuff before I got to be a bus boy. But he didn't like it. Uh, he didn't like it at all. Um, he, he, he was, you know, sort of into himself. And that's, that's a big reason why he, he, was, he left Hong Kong uh, and ended up in the States because uh, he was into himself and he, was, and he got into too many fights at Hong Kong. And the father wanted him out of Hong Kong basically to save his life because, uh, you know, all the, all the different uh, gangs in Hong Kong were after him. So, you know, that, that's, that's a little bit what I remember. Uh, and there's other, other things that he did. Uh, I'll share this one, uh, one time that when he was upstairs on the third floor at the restaurant, uh, he, uh, I went up to his room and, uh, and I asked him how fast he was. And he uh, basically said, here, grab this tissue. And it was a tissue. This is a Kleenex tissue. He says, now lift it up there, lift it up high and drop it. And so I did. And he went through some type of motion, a, a punch motion. And, and the tissue kept going down to the floor. And then he, he asked me to pick it up and open it up and there was two finger holes in the tissue. So he had put two finger holes into the tissue without disturbing the fall, the falling of the tissue. And to me, that was kind of amazing. So 